로마서 3장 9절에서 20절입니다. 그러면 어떠하뇨? 우리는 나으뇨? 결코 아니라 유대인이나 헬라인이나 다죄 아래 있다고 우리가 이미 선언하였느니라. 기록한 바 의인은 하나도 하나도 없나니 의인은 없나니 하나도 없으며 깨닫는 자도 없고 하나님을 찾는 자도 없고 다 치우쳐 한 가지로 무익하게 되고 선을 행하는 자는 없나니 하나도 없다다. 저희의 목구멍은 열린 무덤이요 그 혈우는 속임을 뱉으며 그 입술에는 독사의 독이 있고 그 입에는 저주와 악독이 가득하고 그 발은 피 흘리는 데 빠른지라 파멸과 고생이 그 집에 있어 평강의 길을 알지 못하였고 저희 눈앞에 하나님을 두려워함이 없느니라 함과 같으니라 우리가 알거니와 무릇 율법이 말하는 바는 율법 아래 있는 자들에게 말하는 것이니 이는 모든 입을 막고 온 세상으로 하나님의 심판 아래 있게 하려니 함이니라 그러므로 율법의 행위로 그의 앞에 의롭다 하심을 얻을 육체가 없나니 율법으로는 죄를 깨달음이니라. 아멘. Amen. Romans chapter 3 verses 9 through 20. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says... It says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth be, may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Amen. Let's pray, please. Lord, thank you for this, your holy word. Thank you for this message, and thank you for these people who are here today. Lord, I pray that your good and your perfect will would be done, that, Lord, we would certainly have eyes to see and ears to hear what you, mighty God, has for us this day. Let us draw near to you through this message, through your word, giving you all the glory, for it's in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Guilty. That's the title. You know, as I've been reading through Romans here and studying, these first few chapters of Romans are very hard to get through. And the reason they're very hard to get through is because they're so condemning to the human race, to mankind. You know, men like to believe that they are basically good, but, we are, but fallen natural man is under sin no matter what we say. In other words, all men are sinners, both by character and by conduct. Men may not be equal in their sinning, but we are all condemned as sinners. Some of us sin more than others. Some of our sins are worse than others. At least we think so, but we're all under sin. We're all under the curse. We're all sinners. Each and every person... Religious Jew or irreligious uh, Gentile, we stand guilty before God's justice. And Paul has built God's case against the pagan world, against those who think they are good, even against God's people. Now with devastating finality, he reveals that the whole human race stands condemned. Through the indictment of God's word, Paul proves that everyone is a sinner in God's eyes. Scripture's repeated testimony of all and none assert mankind's universal guilt. If there is to be any hope for any individual, it must be found only in God's mercy and in His grace. Without God's mercy... Without God's grace, there is no hope for any human being. 
He is our only hope. And because of the unchangeable fact that all are sinners, the way of acceptance before God is totally closed without God allowing it to be open or opening it to us. No actions of righteousness or good deeds can open the way to God. Only God can open it. It's a one-way door. We cannot open the door. God opens the door to us. Before Paul gives scriptures charge, he gives the indictment, the arraignment here in verse 9. He says, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Now, in the previous passage, Paul insisted that the Jews had special privileges Their privileges were special because they had been entrusted with the very words of God. But this doesn't mean that the Jews are any better than anyone else because they they misused the word of God. They had the word of God. He gave it to them. He chose them as his chosen people. But they were still sinners just like everybody else. They were no better off. Everyone is under condemnation. The entire human race, without exception, is charged as a sinner before God's court of justice. God's charge is that all people, both Gentiles and Jews, are under the power of sin. Without Christ... Man is under the dominion of sin, and we are helpless in ourselves to escape from it. As our best days, the best times that we are the best that we can be, is still nothing before God's righteousness. You know, we may move from one sin to another sin and the next sin, but let's face it, we're all controlled by sin. And to be under sin is to be under the authority of sin. So it doesn't sound very good for us, does it? You know, privileged or not privileged, all stand equally in the need of God's mercy and grace. We all have to have his mercy. We all have to have his grace. Now, that's not to say that man doesn't have sometimes a moral consciousness. Because all men everywhere was given by God a moral conscience, uh, as Paul has stated earlier in Romans. Uh, God universally gave every person and society to some degree some moral discernment. There's no family, no tribe, no people, no nation that's so degraded that it doesn't have some moral code of what is right and what is wrong. What the people think, though, might be right or what they think to be wrong may be strange to us because of how we're raised and because of different situations, but everyone has some moral sensitivity because God made us that way. So let's look at something. Let's look at first the character. It says we are sinners by character. To validate this accusation that everyone is under sin, there's six. Six Old Testament passages are quoted by Paul. They are strung together like a string of pearls to prove a doctrine of universal sinfulness of mankind. The first sense is verses 10 and 11, and it speaks to man's character. The first sentence in verse 10 is quoted from Psalm 14.1. It's like a theme for what follows. He says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks for God. Now, men are not righteous. And they cannot be justified on the basis of their own righteousness in the sight of God. There are no exceptions to that. No exceptions whatsoever. In verses 10 through 18, Paul uses the term no one or not even one six times referring to man's absolute lack of righteousness before God. No one is right before God 
or who is uh, who God created man to be and expected man to be. Now, some people are offended, actually offended by the Bible's proclamation that all have sinned and that no one is righteous. There's, uh, I have actually had people t- very get very angry and mad uh, when they hear this and they think about it. But these people say, you know, I'm not a sinner. I'm, I'm good and I'm a righteous person and I'm a good citizen and I'm a good neighbor and I'm a good father and I'm a good husband or a good wife. I'm a good worker. I do all these good things. How dare you judge me and tell me that I am a sinner? Usually they support their argument by pointing to the sins of others. They're comparing themselves to other human beings. God does not claim that all have committed the same sins or that we're all equally having the same sins. He just says that we all are sinners. God does claim that when measured by the perfect standard of the life of his son Jesus, we all fall short. Anything that separates us from God is a sin. And self-righteousness keeps millions of people from seeking God's mercy and God's grace. I'll say that one more time. People's self-righteousness keeps them from God more than anything else because they don't seek God's mercy. They don't seek His grace. They think they don't need it because they are self-righteous. We need to confess our unrighteousness to God and we need to thank Him for His grace. The second quote found in verse 11 says that man is not only universally unrighteous but are spiritually incompetent. There is no one who understands. The word understands here means to bring together or to grasp or to comprehend. Understand expresses the right. Let me, let me put it this way. It means to have the right understanding or the right comprehension of the truth. God's truth. The divine truth. It's a negative statement concerning mankind's universal lack of understanding God. Let me tell you, we are so unrighteous and God is so righteous, it's difficult for us to understand the righteousness of God. We're so degraded ourselves that it's hard for us to understand God's righteousness. You know, because there's much misunderstanding or indifference to God in His way. This is the second characteristic of the man who's under sin. Right comprehension or spiritual discernment of divine things is always accompanied with right afflictions and right pursuits. So therefore... The third denunciation is there's no one who seeks God. No one who seeks God. He that does not understand proves that he does not understand by not seeking God. That's how we prove that we don't understand God. is Because we don't go after him. We don't seek him. And that just shows our misunderstanding of God even more. If anyone truly understood who God is or their circumstances, they would seek after him with all their heart and all their soul, all their mind and all their strength. If they truly understand who God is and what kind of condition they are, they're going to do that. But because they don't, they prove that they don't understand God. Verse 12 notes the devastating power of universal sin. It says, all have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. This fourth universal characteristic is crookedness, not walking in the narrow path of God. Blinded by their sin to the perfection and the loveliness of God and His truth. Everyone turns away from what God has prescribed for us. 
we are blinded by the world. We're blinded by our sins. God calls man to his way because it leads him the right way, but man chooses to go another way. God calls us. He calls us to go a certain way because if we go that way, then that way will lead to him. But we choose a different way. All have sinned and all turn aside from God and his will. The fifth characteristic of the Christless character is no benefit in the eternal, uh, basically, economy of God. Natural man can do nothing of eternal benefit. Men do not understand, thus they do not seek God, but seek another way. And the result is we become useless to God. Because we don't understand God, because we don't choose to follow God, we become no use to God or his kingdom. That is the fifth characteristic. And the sixth characteristic here is the absence of good or positive in our lives, in men's lives. It's impossible to do something good in God's eyes without being in Jesus Christ. Our righteousness, the best we can do. Isaiah says they are as filthy rags before God. The world has been inscrutably searched throughout all the ages. And it says not even one, not even one truly righteous was found. That's a sad comment on the characteristic of mankind. And then remember there's characteristics and then there's conduct. We are sinners by conduct. The next section here emphasizes some of the consequences of sin by the way we conduct ourselves, human conduct. The first element of conduct de uh, dealt here is in verses 13 and 14, and it's man's speech which proves his gross immorality. He says their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Again, not a very good commentary on mankind. First in verse 13 is a destructive power that gives the tongue its words. Their throat is like an open grave. If you can imagine a grave with a body in it that's open and this body is decaying for days and the terrible smell it lets off, you get an idea of the natural man's speech as heard by God. It's a terrible thing to have our speech to be compared to the decaying of a body, an open grave. That's a terrible stench. That means that we have nothing good to say before God at all. The second use of their tongues is deceive themselves and others. They make smooth, flattering statements which deceive. The imperfect tense here denotes repeated actions, continuous. It preserves, it, it keeps going. They, they're hypocritical in their statements. They, they don't stop. We don't stop. And the third graphic description is quoted in Psalm 143. The bite of the viper causes severe pain as well as producing death. To verbally inflict suffering is to delight to the sinner who has chosen their own way instead of God's way. You see, the, true, the, the natural man is truly sinful. We will use our mouths many times to inflict hurt and pain on others. And we use them in a terrible way. The fourth quote concerning speech is from Psalm 10, verse 17. Cursing carries the idea of pronouncing ill will upon someone or something. Bitterness is to cut or to prick, uh, pointed or sharp. Here it means a sharp pointed statements. 
Verses 15 and 17 indicate the conduct or the actions of a sinful person. And the 11th charge is their murderous intent put forth in verse 15. We're still people who desire to see violence and do violence. If you don't believe me, just, just look at our sports on TV. Which sports do the best, get the highest ratings? Sports where people get hurt. Hockey really does real well. But people don't like hockey if there's no fighting. Boxing does real well. Everything. We like our sports. We like to see violence. Our TV shows, we have a lot of violence. I, I'm guilty too. I like watching a good cowboy show. Shoot them up, bang, bang type stuff, you know. But that's, it's funny, but in a way it's sad. Because that's the way we humans are. We sort of like violence, don't we? Our movies, we like violent movies. If you, and then just look at the news in the country or all around the world. There's so much violence going on all the time. So we are violent people. That's the way we are. The 12th charge in the overall indictment is in verse 16. It says, ruin and misery mark their ways. Just as feet speak of man's ways, so do paths. Natural man's paths, ways, through life is marked with spreading ruin and misery to the lives of others. The destruction and misery of lost sinners may not occur immediately, but destruction will certainly come. One of the reasons that we continue to sin and continue to disobey God is because God is patient with us. And we think we got away with it, so we keep on sinning. The thirteenth and last of the charges is the indictment of the condemned man is his lack of peace. And verse 17 says, the way of peace they do not know. Possible here is not talking about inner peace. This particular passage is not inner peace. It's not inside of us. What it means is this is a natural inclination for us to be against peace. We really like conflict sometimes more than we do peace. They do not know how to preserve peace with others or how to obtain peace for themselves. The charge is sort of counterpart to the previous one because of all the fighting and the Destruction, we like that, and we don't like peace. The basic reason for, for man's condition is expressed in verse 18, which is quoted from Psalm 36, 1. He says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God. All scriptural, previous scriptural proofs here are because of this last summation, if you will, Man is deprived because he does not fear God. The fear of God, according to Scripture, is a reverence for God or a respect for God. So the reckless and the wicked are lacking in this attitude toward God. They don't have any reverence for God and they don't respect God. They act as if there is no God who would hold them responsible for their character, for their conversation, for their conduct. They act like there is no God. They can do whatever they want to. They have no respect, no regard, no awe of God. I fear God. I fear God in the sense that I revere Him and I stand in awe of His holiness and His power. And because I do, I love Him. And because I love him, I want to draw close to him. And the reason I want to draw close to him and the best way to get close to God is to obey him. It's my desire to love what God loves and to hate what God hates. I want to live my whole life with the realization that he deserves more fear from me than anyone or anything else. And fear being respect and awe. But yet 
many of us don't live like that. We might say we do, but our lives do not reflect that we fear God. We always are putting other things and other people and other things before God Almighty. Well, which is it? What do you fear? What do you love? Or who do you love? With all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Everybody's quick to say, oh, it's God, it's God. But they don't live that way. And because of that, we're under condemnation. Sinners are under condemnation. The conclusion reached by Scripture is given in verses 19 and 20. Look at what it says. Let's read it again straight, through, straight from the word here. Follow along as I read in verse 19. It says, but now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Held accountable to God. Scripture now says here, we know. That indicates that it's plain or universally understood. The law is the will of God and it's the norm or the rule which individuals and societies and nations, we are supposed to conform our lives to God's rules and God's norms. It can be the Ten Commandments. It can be the law of Moses. It can be the scriptures or even the rule of God written on man's heart in our conscience. When God opens his books and he prosecutes those who are standing before him, unredeemed man will be given the opportunity to answer the charges and we will have no defense. We will have no defense when we stand before God. That's the point we all must understand. We may have a defense for our actions today. We may have a defense for our we're not putting God first in our lives. We have excuses. We have reasons. But when we stand before God, those will carry no weight at all. Because God knows your heart. There is no defense. It says here, their guilt having been exposed, they will have no answer because their mouths will be silenced. Stopped. God's just judgment will be concluded in such a way that all the world is accountable to God. And accountable here is a legal term meaning liable or answerable to God. Everyone will be guilty and liable for their sin in God's court. Everyone. Now strangely, and I know it's true, people use all kinds of excuses and alibis and objections to try to avoid recognizing and repenting of their sins. If we dare to let God speak to us through his word, our loud mouths will be stopped. We will see our excuses for what they are. They are evasions of the truth and denials of our deep need for God, His love and His mercy. But see, when we're willing, when our hearts are not hardened, when we are willing to hear God, when we're willing to hear His condemnation, and we're really ready to hear his sentence of guilty upon us, then we can quick to say, Lord, I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness. You see, ask God who, who sees your heart to help you to put aside all these excuses and all these evasions of him and his word. That's why David was able to be forgiven of his sin, his terrible sin of his uh, adultery and, and his murder. 
David did that. He was guilty of adultery and murder. But because when he heard God's condemnation, he repented of his sins, he admitted, he heard God, and he needed God's mercy and grace. Verse 20 concludes this discussion of the universal condemnation of mankind. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. This is the conclusion of this whole argument has moved toward. Men cannot be justified by their own righteousness or works. The purpose of the law is to produce a consciousness of sin. The law is there to convict our hearts. You may justify yourself before man, but we cannot justify justify ourselves before God. God, therefore, must save us by some other means. And the explanation of the means by which man can be saved is taught in the rest of the letter of Romans. The first few chapters of Romans are so hard to get through because they are a terrible, terrible statement about mankind. But it's all true. So in conclusion, Paul uses multiple Old Testament references to show that humanity in its present sinful condition is unacceptable before God. Have you ever thought to yourself, well, well, I'm not too bad. I'm, I'm a pretty good person. Well, if you feel that way sometimes, then you need to look at these verses and, and see if any of them apply to you. Even simple, simple things sometimes like, have you ever lied? Have you ever hurt someone by your voice or by the tone of your voice? Whether you meant to or not, have you ever done it? Are you ever bitter toward one? Are you ever upset with someone? Do you become angry with those who disagree with you? We must remember who we are in God's sight. We are sinners. Don't deny that you're a sinner. Instead, allow the fact that you're desperate and that you need God's grace and you need His mercy points you toward Jesus Christ. That's why this whole thing, that's why Paul spent so much time in developing a very sad scene, a very sad commentary on mankind. Because he's trying to get everyone to see our condition and point us towards Jesus Christ. There's no other way. We all need Jesus. As long as we defend ourselves, though, and commend ourselves, we cannot be saved by God's grace. We have to just give up. Give up ourselves and say, Lord, the only thing I have is your mercy and your grace. There's nothing else I can bring before you. All we have to do is confess our guilt. And our need of God's grace. God provided. He provided it in his son. But we must admit that we need it. We must accept Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, forgive us. We are a terrible, terrible thing. We are sinners. We've all failed you terribly.